Item number, SCP-032. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-032 is to be housed in Automated Containment Unit 535-15. Direct contact with SCP-032 is to be restricted to research-relevant tasks only. Interviews, if deemed necessary, are to be carried out using the unit's remote communication array. While SCP-032's presence is not directly harmful to the human body, exposure to it is to be limited to periods of 12 hours or less due to its adverse effects on most beneficial microorganisms. SCP-032 is not to be exposed to any biological material not refined or otherwise tempered by humanity, with an emphasis on non-human living entities. SCP-032 neither requires nor requested substances or other forms of comfort. Description: SCP-032 is a Type F, imperfect external resemblance, internally inconsistent, human simulacrum of currently unknown origins. It is composed of an outer shell of pigmented silicone 5.5 mm thick and various plastic fiber polymers, with an outward appearance of a Caucasian woman nearing the third decade of life. SCP-032's interior is composed entirely of liquid refined oil, lacking any skeletal or muscle structure. Despite this, SCP-032 is capable of locomotion and speech. SCP-032 is capable of maintaining the illusion of humanity at a moderate distance, but becomes unconvincing at a closer range, causing mild discomfort in most observers. This effect has been deemed non-anomalous. Despite apparently possessing fully realized cognitive abilities, SCP-032 claims that it is not sapient, acting only as an intermediary instrument of its creators. The Foundation has not been able to verify or refute this claim as of yet. SCP-032 possesses extreme adverse effects to any biological entity in its close vicinity, not created, willfully influenced, manipulated by, or similarly relating to humanity. While the exact nature of these effects varies, SCP-032's presence inevitably causes severe and irreparable damage to the ability of any living organism to exchange and or use energy. Wild flora loses its ability to photosynthesize or otherwise produce or consume energy, fauna the use of its respiratory and digestive systems, etc. This applies to microorganisms as well, though SCP-032's effects seem to favor damage to their reproductive systems instead. It is hypothesized that the symbiotic relation some microorganisms have to humanity is the reason for this discrepancy. SCP-032 was discovered sitting on the doorstep of the inner compound of Foundation Site near Slovakia. When questioned by Foundation security personnel, SCP-032 explained its anomalous effects and claims it was there to be stored. Surveillance footage show no record of the time of its arrival, and it is not yet known how SCP-32 came to know site its location or approach it without being spotted. When asked for its reason for seeking Foundation custody, SCP-032 replied that it was there at the command of its creators, seeking indefinite storage until claimed. Addendum Interview 032-A Note this interview was recorded near the time of SCP-032's initial containment by Dr. Alexander Kovac, Site resident psychologist, following its initial examination by Site Security. Begin Log Dr. Kovac, before we begin, there's something I feel I should ask you, since security so often neglects doing so. It's not strictly conforming to protocol, but I find it tends to make things easier. SCP-032 I was instructed to cooperate. Dr. Kovach. Good. Very good. Tell me then, what is your name? SCP-032. I don't have one. People have names. I'm not one. Dr. Kovach. Is that so? What did your so-called creators call you then? SCP-032. They didn't. Dr. Kovach. Surely they had to refer to you somehow. SCP-032. I am a vessel of their will and nothing else. They never needed to call. They never will. Dr. Kovach. In that case, would you mind if I referred to you as SCP-032? SCP-032. I was instructed to cooperate. Dr. Kovach. So you said. So you said. Tell me then, 
What is the purpose of your coming here? SCP-032. I am to be stored here until collected. Dr. Kovach. Security told me that much. But why here? And collected by whom? SCP-032. Collected by the ones they wish to torment. And stored here because in finding me here he will suffer further. Dr. Kovach. Is that so? Is that person you refer to part of this organization then? Do your creators bear some grudge towards a particular operative? SCP-032. He is not one of you. Merely a one-time sympathizer of sorts. He believes you tried to help him once, and if he is forced here, if he finds me here, you will die. That will hurt him. They have no interest in any of you or your organization. You are here as a tool, just as I am. Dr. Kovach, who is this man then? What did he do to earn this sort of treatment from your creators? SCP-032. He did not know his place, won when he should have lost, and was proud when he should have been humbled. Was wasteful with gifts too precious for abuse. Dr. Kovach, and you are here as punishment. SCP-032. He was already punished. Severely. Forced away from kin and kind, to endlessly wander, to destroy against his will, to poison humanity by his very presence. Eternal solitude. Flavored by ceaseless guilt. A masterwork of torment, they say. Dr. Kovach, if that's the case, why are you here? SCP-032. Because even in this existence, there is the occasional moment of solace. At times, he may yet look to the world and see things he will not destroy. Look to nature and feel warm wonder, and bask in the false light of ancient, moldy memories. It keeps him sane, gives him hope. That will not serve. Hence my presence. I am to be his last undoing, a hastening to the end of reason. Dr. Kovach, and how will your presence do that? Are you meant to deceive him in some way? Is that why you look the way you do? SCP-032, in a manner of speaking, eventually, his wanderings will lead him here, to me, in a day, or a month, or a century, and he will recognize me, and see what they think of his precious memories, how they mock them. He'll understand that because of his actions, she is forever beyond his grasp, and all that remains to him is me. A simulacrum as artificial as his hope. When he finds me, I will attach myself to him, and he will watch the mockery of his memories destroy his last source of solace, and that will be that. Dr. Kovach, I, um, you said he will recognize you. Why? SCP-032, I used to be his wife. End log. Interview 032-B. Note. This interview was held six months following SCP-032's initial containment, as part of a series of interviews meant to evaluate SCP-032's cognitive abilities and personality, or lack thereof. Begin log. SCP-032. I hate her. Dr. Kovach. That's certainly a way to start an interview. Care to elaborate? SCP-032. The one I was made to look like. My... Mold. I hate her. Dr. Kovach, an interesting sentiment for you to have, considering your repeated assurance that you possess no consciousness or feelings of your own. SCP-032, I don't. I hate her because they want me to. It serves their purpose. Dr. Kovach, how do you get that impression? SCP-032, the first thing they did after creating me was to show her to me. It's not something they often do. Dr. Kovach, I don't follow. SCP-032, interfere with those who passed beyond their halls. They might be vengeful, spiteful, even cruel, but they take their duties very seriously. Just to show her to me, to risk disturbing her final rest, they wouldn't do that without a purpose. Dr. Kovach, and SCP-032, she was beautiful, so peaceful, serene, whole even gone, even dead. I could see the essence of who she used to be, of who she still was and forever will be, her soul. They told me she didn't get to live for all that long, but when she lived, she was herself. She was alive, and so I hated her. SCP-032, do you know what it feels like to be made as a mockery? In every line of that smooth, silent face, I saw a twisted reflection in my own. 
fragrant skin to molded plastic, soft hair to synthetic fiber, blood to oil, soul to nothing at all. Dr. Kovach, excuse me if this sounds presumptuous, but I can't imagine feelings like this coming from anywhere but yourself. SCP-032 shakes head. Can't you see? This is all a part of their plan. When he finds me, when he sees what the brothers created just to punish him further, he'll go mad. Dr. Kovach, because of what they did to the memory of his wife, SCP-032, not only that, because he'll see me, he'll see how much I hate her, and how much I hate myself for not being her, hate being here at all. Dr. Kovach, and then what? SCP-032, then, a final realization. Dr. Kovach, and what would that be? SCP-032, he never won. End log. Item number, SCP-070. Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-070 is to be kept within a 10 meter by 10 meter reinforced concrete room that is to be guarded and remotely monitored at all times. This room must always be well stocked with non-perishable food and water, as well as basic amenities for humanoid SCPs. Security personnel assigned to SCP-070 are to carry sticky foam guns in addition to standard armaments. Structural integrity of SCP-070's containment room is to be checked twice daily. In case of excessive structural damage, SCP-070 is to be incapacitated and relocated to a nearby backup containment room, as described above. If a reinforced concrete room of sufficient strength is not available, SCP-070 may be temporarily contained in a cell of stronger material until another concrete room can be prepared. SCP-070 is to be given sedatives and painkillers on request, but no more than maximum dosage is determined by Dr. Dumont. Personnel who enter SCP-070's containment room for any reason must be unarmed, and should wear puncture-resistant body armor. Armed guards must remain outside and out of sight of SCP-070. In case of containment breach due to somnambulism, Security personnel are to alert site administration, place food and water in the apparent path of SCP-070, and maintain a clear zone of 25 meters around SCP-070. In any other case of containment breach, or if SCP-070 becomes violent during somnambulism, personnel are authorized to incapacitate SCP-070 using sticky foam. Care must be taken to avoid smothering SCP-070. Because SCP-070 reflexively responds violently to injury or attack, security personnel should refrain from using lethal force or otherwise injuring SCP-070 if at all possible. Description SCP-070 appears to be a human male of Native American descent, with a normal appearance, save for a pair of rusty metal wings emerging from his back. Each wing is composed of several flat iron bars about six centimeters wide, connected end-to-end -end by rotating rivets, to form an articulated length of metal over two meters long. Hanging from these bars are chains of various lengths, 22 on each wing, each tipped with a barbed arrowhead. SCP-070 appears to have no other anomalous properties besides these wings. The wings of SCP-070 appear to act independently of the person they are attached to, and SCP-070 has stated repeatedly that it has no control over them. However, when damage has been done to the wings, SCP-070 has shown signs of physiological distress, including sweating, reduced blood flow to face, and screaming in pain. The wings have been observed to fold and expand, shoot out and whip its chains at high speed, both individually and collectively, and anchor its arrowheads into concrete, wood, and like materials. While SCP-070 has not displayed any overt hostility to personnel, it will often react violently to perceived threats by lashing its chains out at assailants and wrapping its chains around its body in a defensive posture. The most effective means of subdual has proven to be sticky foam, non-lethal weaponry, which can reliably ensnare SCP-070's chains from a safe distance. Despite their rusted appearance, the wings and chains of SCP-070 are as strong as high-quality alloy steel. However, they are also as dense as steel, and SCP-070 cannot move about as a normal human due to the weight of its wings. As yet, SCP-070 has been unable or unwilling to use its wings to facilitate human locomotion, 
SCP-070 spends much of its time anchored to the walls and ceiling of its containment cell, usually sedated. Addendum 070-1 Incident 070-1 On at 3.36, SCP-070 breached containment. Security personnel were advised that SCP-070 appeared to be asleep and were ordered to not engage SCP-070 and to keep others away. By lashing and anchoring chains into the walls and ceiling in front of it, SCP-070 was able to carry itself, still apparently asleep, through sight- SCP-070 broke into the food stores of Canteen 4 and proceeded to gorge itself on the available food and water. Almost 19 minutes later, apparently sated, SCP-070 returned to its containment room. At no time did SCP-070 appear to wake up. SCP-070 claimed no knowledge of the event afterward. Addendum 070-2 Personal Background Interviews have revealed that SCP-070 is named and is capable of reciting the correct social security number for a US citizen of the same name and age. SCP-070 claims to be a member of the Kiowa tribe and data expunged. SCP-070 claims to not know how the wings came to be, only remembering waking up in a scrapyard with them after taking a lot of peyote the night before. Item Number SCP-073 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-073 is to be kept in a two-room cell, furnished with all non-organic furniture and items, and a bathroom. Subject is allowed to freely wander the facility and eat in the main canteen. A tracking device has been attached to SCP-073's person and is not to be removed. Subject is disallowed any contact with the surface and is not allowed outside the facility. Subject is allowed no contact with plant-based SCPs under any circumstances. Violence is not to be used against SCP-073 under any circumstances. SCP-073 is currently kept in Site-17. Description SCP-073 appears to be a heavily tanned male of Arabic or Middle Eastern descent in his early 30s, 185 centimeters or 6 feet and 1 inches tall, and 75 kilograms or 165 pounds, with black hair and blue eyes. Arms, legs, spinal cord, and shoulder blades of the subject appear to have been replaced with artificial versions of unknown make and metal. Subject only takes notice of this when it is pointed out and states that it has no knowledge of how, why, or when these replacements took place, stating it had them as long as it could remember. There is a symbol engraved into the forehead of the subject, which appears to be of Sumerian origin. Symbol has as of yet been untranslated and subject appears distressed when the symbol is mentioned at all, refusing to speak on it. Subject does not need to eat and drink on a regular basis, but is strictly carnivorous, owing to its effect on plant-based items. SCP-073, who refers to itself as Cain, is generally polite and genial to all who speak to it, though it has been described as being cold and somewhat mechanical in its speech. It is very helpful and enjoys aiding personnel in their daily actions, whatever they may be. It has highly detailed knowledge of ancient to recent events in history and most commonly spoken languages in the world, including ones that have since died out. Subject has professed to having a photographic memory, remembering word for word all text in an 800-page dictionary that was flicked through in a minute and a half. It has scored above average in all intelligence tests given to it. SCP-073's presence is inimical to any and all life grown in soil, causing death to any such life within a 20-meter radius. Any land SCP-073 has walked on, and any within the 20-meter radius, becomes barren as all anaerobic bacteria dies, rendering the soil incapable of supporting life until new bacteria are introduced. Anything that is derived from soil-grown life, such as wood and paper, immediately rots and disintegrates upon touch of SCP-073. Further affected derivatives include anything hydroponically grown. Violence directed towards SCP-073 reflects any damage inflicted on SCP-073 directly back onto the attacker, although SCP-073 visibly remains unharmed. This applies to any damage directed at SCP-073. Attempts to get tissue and blood samples have proven futile 
When the procedure was initiated, personnel carrying out the action felt the sensation of whatever was applied to SCP-073 and wound up with a sample of their own blood or tissue. Despite the fact that all actions were directed solely at SCP-073, indirect damage through a medium also results in the person perpetrating the action receiving the wounds caused. Although SCP-073 receives no actual harm from damage to its person, it has stated that it still feels the pain of the action and has politely asked researchers to abstain from overly harmful actions to its person. Additional Notes SCP-073 was found in the New York Police Department in 19... having been taken in after subject had been found amidst the bodies of several violent gang members. SCP-073 told police members that the gang had attempted to make sport of it, but became angry and attempted to kill SCP-073, resulting in their own demise. SCP-073 was incarcerated and was deemed a John Doe when NYPD could not find any information on it. SCP-073 came to the attention of the Foundation through a routine inspection of John Doe's and was subsequently released into our custody. Addendum 073-1 In light of SCP-073's indestructible nature, photographic memory, and general will to please, High Command have deemed that all information is to be backed up on SCP-073, ensuring it is not lost in the event of a catastrophe. While this action has met with mixed responses, SCP-073 has agreed and sworn itself to secrecy on its part. Addendum 073-2 When information concerning SCP-076 was brought to the attention of SCP-073 for backing up, subject showed familiarity with the information although was disinclined to adding to it, despite the fact that it stated that it already knew all about SCP-076. It then stated it would be better for all parties involved that it not meet SCP-076. Addendum 073-3 Examination of the unidentified metal on SCP-073 has suggested that it is beryllium bronze, a metal that has been documented as being utilized by various anomalous cultures and entities. Most notably, Beryllium bronze is a component found in SCP-1216, SCP-1427, SCP-2481, and SCP-2711. In light of this discovery, the Foundation began working in an attempt to trace the origin of beryllium bronze and how it initially spread throughout the world. When prompted, SCP-073 was able to provide information that suggests that beryllium bronze originated in the Middle East though the exact point of origin has yet to be determined. Further research into the origin of beryllium bronze is currently ongoing. Item Number SCP-100 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-100 is to have six guards patrolling the interior of the perimeter's fencing and two guards dedicated to the monitoring of the interior and exterior of both warehouses and the residential building with rotations to occur every three hours. Any unauthorized personnel found within SCP-100 are to be detained for questioning prior to amnestic administration and release. Three guards are to remain within the storefront of SCP-100, with rotations to occur every eight hours. The storefront front entrance is to remain locked at all times, with keys provided to necessary personnel. Private property and no trespassing signs are to be posted on the front of the storefront to deter any drivers from stopping at SCP-100. Any constructs SCP-101 creates are to be removed from SCP-100 and melted down into slag, with the exception of SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B. Should SCP-101 become uncooperative, SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B may be removed from SCP-100 until the time that SCP-101 becomes cooperative again. The largest of the two warehouses within SCP-100 has been converted into a basic research facility. All objects created by SCP-101, excluding SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, may be used for research purposes. Testing on SCP-101 itself may only be conducted with written permission from the acting head researcher. Description: SCP-100 is an abandoned scrapyard, 80 kilometers from South Carolina, known as Jamaican Joe's Junkyard Jubilee. The scrapyard covers roughly 5,000 square meters of fenced-off land, 
consisting of two warehouses, a storefront, and a small residential building, as well as neglected land and land used for storage. SCP-100 holds roughly 1,500 vehicles, both pressed and unpressed, as well as roughly 1,400 kilograms of separate scrap, estimated to be worth $5,000 or 3,870 euros. SCP-100's anomalous effect manifests through SCP-101 and its constructs, including SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B. Autonomy is lost when SCP-101 or one of its objects cross the fenced perimeter of SCP-100, remaining in this state until reintroduction. SCP-101 is an autonomous, sapient, humanoid construct consisting mostly of copper piping, uninsulated copper wiring, and aluminum cans. SCP-101 lacks the ability for written or verbal communication. However, it possesses the ability to communicate using rudimentary sign language. SCP-101 is largely uninterested in conversation outside of sales, and information gathered from it has been limited. SCP-101 appears to possess skill and craftsmanship, demonstrating the ability to operate tools such as arc welders, drills, and power saws, as well as heavy machinery such as car compressors and forklifts. SCP-101 possesses the ability to create autonomous constructs similar to itself, using material available within SCP-100. SCP-101 tends to create four specific animals – iguanas, crocodiles, turtles, and flamingos. However, SCP-101 has been known to craft other species, such as domestic pets. To maintain compliance, SCP-101 has been allowed to keep two objects, labeled SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B. SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B are constructs superficially resembling insects, assumed to be created by SCP-100, as they have occupied SCP-100 since the initial discovery of SCP-100. The names Ramon and Beatrice are welded into the backs of SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, respectively. They appear to operate as both companions as well as guards for SCP-100 100 as they patrol the perimeter of SCP-100 except during intervals of interaction with SCP-101. SCP-101 appears to follow a ritualistic schedule, repeating the same actions daily. From 0800 to 1500 hours, SCP-101 enters the storefront of SCP-100, seating itself behind a counter and attempting to bargain with any humans within the storefront. Occasionally, SCP-101 will return to the yard prematurely for reasons unknown. From 1500 to 1600 hours, SCP-101 interacts with SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, communicating using vague hand and arm gestures. Interaction tends to consist of grooming, repair, and activities resembling fetch and hide-and-seek. From 1600 to 2000 hours, SCP-101 performs various tasks, including taking stock of material within SCP-100, cleaning and maintaining tools and heavy machinery and cleaning the interiors and exteriors of buildings present within SCP-100. From 20 hundred hours to 0 hundred hours, SCP-101 performs what is assumed to be leisurely acts, ranging from creating new constructs, interacting with SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, and patrolling SCP-100. From 0 hundred hours to 0800, SCP-101 enters the residential building, where it remains seated at a desk for the duration of this time. In the event that a human enters the storefront of SCP-100 during the interval of time SCP-101 is seated behind the counter, SCP-101 will attempt to bargain with them, using a variety of gestures to convey meaning. Most attempts by SCP-101 are to sell scrap, figures of its own creation, or repair services. However, it has been known to purchase scrap. Despite SCP-101's inability to read, it possesses the ability to perform basic mathematics as demonstrated by sales. Sales made by SCP-101 are typically met with some degree of unfairness. SCP-101 has been known to intentionally use faulty scales and contaminate scrap piles with cheaper metals, and has demonstrated knowledge of the area of effect within SCP-100, as SCP-101 has sold constructs repeatedly, despite the loss of autonomy when exiting SCP-100. Efforts to confront SCP-101 about this have been met with both distress and indifference, with referral to a signed post-it on the wall reading, No refunds, man. 
happening regardless of SCP-101's emotional response. SCP-101 was discovered on 110976, following reports of strange machines operating from within the scrapyard. These rumors were discredited as urban legends, and a Foundation agent was sent to SCP-100 to act as the landowner until containment was performed under the guise of property sale. A wooden privacy fence was built along the former perimeter of SCP-100, one-way windows were installed in the storefront, and a highway now running through the nearby town of redirects the majority of civilian traffic. Addendum 100A Records show the property is owned by one Joseph Duvall, with the mailing address sharing the same name. Local utility companies report billing had stopped approximately three months before the discovery of SCP-100, which was found abandoned save for SCP-101, SCP-102-A, SCP-102-B, and several avian and canine figures, presumed to be made by SCP-101. The initial sweep of the buildings revealed the residential building to be mostly bare, with the only sign of former occupants being a note found taped to the door of the storefront. Incident 100A On 060305, SCP-101 created a humanoid, autonomous construct, 10 centimeters in height, the first time SCP-101 has done so. Significant effort was put into this construct compared to others, with greater detail applied to the construct, including facial features, and JJ welded into the back of the construct, and stainless steel making up the majority of the construct. SCP-101 placed the construct on the counter of the storefront for the duration of this scheduled interval, both using vague gestures to seemingly communicate with one another. Following the confiscation of this construct, SCP-101 remained seated within the residential building of SCP-100 for a total of 10 days. Document 100-A The following is a copy of the note recovered upon discovery of SCP-100. Out to lunch. Please see assistant. JJ. Item number. SCP-172. Object Class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. Any personnel wishing to access SCP-172 must receive written approval and undergo a one-hour training session. All interaction with SCP-172 must be overseen by at least one Class IV operative, who may end the session at their discretion. Any and all records, drawings, or correspondence produced by SCP-172 are to be submitted immediately to Dr. for review. Reasonable requests made by SCP-172 are to be granted after approval by said doctor. SCP-172 is to be allowed out of its containment area with approval, as long as it is accompanied by an armed Class IV operative. Armed personnel are to be stationed at the door of SCP-172. Should SCP-172 attempt to escape, it is to first be asked to cease and desist, and then led back to its containment area. Containment area is to be kept stocked with paper, pencils, and any additional components requested by SCP-172. Tables, chairs, and any additional furnishings requested by SCP-172 are to be provided pending approval by Dr. Upon entering its dormant state, SCP-172 should be placed in its transportation box until rewound. Description SCP-172 appears to be a human being, 34 years of age, 185 centimeters or 6 foot 1 inches tall, black hair and mustache, 175.5 kilograms or 386 pounds, and of Russian descent. SCP-172's personality is very friendly and intelligent, if somewhat dull and repetitive. SCP-172 prefers dress from the 1860s. It always wears a large ornate key on a long necklace. SCP-172 has never identified itself by any name, and is not upset by being referred to by its designation number. Internally, SCP-172 is a staggeringly complex automaton, possessing over 2 million moving parts, and 18 million components at last count. Component parts appear to be made of glass, silk, wood, steel, brass, rubber, and several other substances. Similarity between this construction and that of SCP-2776 suggests a similar creator or creators. 
SCP-172 also has several modules that can be installed via a hatch in its chest. These appear to alter behavior, speech, movement, and several parameters based on position in the body cavity and module components. SCP-172 has 46 modules at current count, having built three of these while in Foundation custody. Currently, SCP-172 is loaded with the Engineer module. Modules have been identified by SCP-172 as Caretaker, Soldier, Medic, Mother, and King, though this is by no means a comprehensive list. Under no circumstances are modules to be replaced without O5 level authorization. SCP-172 is powered via a mainspring, which is wound with the key in SCP-172's possession, after inserting it into a hole at the base of the neck. SCP-172 can operate for eight hours on a single full windup. SCP-172 appears wholly human when in operation, and is capable of all basic human functions. SCP-172 has no need to eat, breathe, or sleep, but will perform all these functions if allowed to do so. SCP-172 is extremely obedient, and will follow any instructions given to it to the best of its ability. SCP-172 does not view its existence as strange, and asserts that it is human, even when shown its internal components. SCP-172 is also extremely delicate, and great care must be taken to preserve and maintain its function. SCP-172 has also shown a level of mechanical skill nothing short of miraculous. SCP-172 is capable of analyzing and copying any mechanical device it comes in contact with. This was first shown when it became apparent that locks of any kind cannot contain SCP-172. It has also made several copies or upgraded versions of SCP technology, all based on incredibly complex clockwork. Most notably, data expunged. Document number 172-4R, Notes on Recovery of SCP-172. SCP-172 was recovered after the Great War in a chamber below a former vacation home of the Tsars. Exposed due to stray bombing, the chamber and its contents were badly damaged, but SCP-172 was found intact in an iron crate, along with many modules and its key. Item was removed by operatives and wound up inside testing facilities. SCP-172 appeared to wake up from a deep sleep and proceeded to greet everyone present in Russian. When Agent shouted in surprise, SCP-172 pushed against its chest and repeated its greetings in English. SCP-172, when questioned, stated that its last memory was playing with a young boy. The boy left, and SCP-172 began to feel very tired, so it returned to the box. It has no memory of its creation, creator, or name. Item Number SCP-191 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-191 is currently housed in a 6 meter by 6 meter room at Site 17. To date, SCP-191 has not made any requests for furnishings or entertainment. Current furnishings include one wooden frame futon with a 15 centimeter or 6 inch pad and standard cotton bed sheets and blankets. All sheets are to be sterilized each morning according to standard procedures. The futon pad itself will be replaced every six months, and the old pad discarded through incineration. One standard 220 volt Type G power outlet with an emergency cutoff box, fuse, circuit breaker, and manual non insulating guillotine located outside the cell. One standard hazardous waste disposal unit liquid and solid waste. All drainage tubes shall lead directly to an incinerator unit. SCP-191 is to be dressed in loose, sleeveless garments, made of 100% long staple cotton. Fresh clothing will be provided once daily, with used garments sterilized according to standard procedures. Bathing is to be done once every evening, in a wash tub filled with a solution of water and baking soda. Feeding in the form of a sterile saline solution supplemented with vitamins, minerals, antibiotics, and a mild anesthetic, shall be carried out twice a day 
via injection into a metallic tube located in the base of the neck. SCP-191 is capable of limited self-care, including draining waste and recharging internal batteries. A log shall be kept of power consumption and any unusual changes in power usage reported to supervising staff. Daily inspections for injury should be carried out after bathing. Should SCP-191 require medical care, refer to documents 191 Alpha, Special Medical Needs, and 191 Alpha Supplemental, Repair of Non-Biological Components, before administering care. At least two armed guards are to be present in the room any time that personnel have contact with SCP-191, although a translucent screen may be utilized for privacy purposes. Standard anti-computer countermeasures are ineffective, as SCP-191's components have been hardened against electromagnetic pulse (EMP). Description: SCP-191 is a female human child, approximately years old. It is believed to have been a test subject of several experimental surgeries performed by the late Dr. One. 80% of the left half of the face and skull have been removed, with the eye and ear replaced by a complex transceiver system that allows it to receive and transmit not only visual and auditory input, but a wider spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, ranging from low-frequency radio to high-energy gamma rays. The lower jaw, teeth, and larynx have been removed and replaced with data expunged. The esophagus has been rerouted to an artificial orifice at the back of the neck, feeding tube, and the trachea rerouted directly to an air filtration device. Due to these alterations, SCP-191 is incapable of speech, although it has been reported occasionally vocalizing distress through rapid respiration. 2. An input-output device has been placed into the right forearm, replacing the radius and ulna bones. The device contains interfaces for a variety of modern and obsolete formats, including USB, Ethernet, Firewire, and DIN-8 PIN, as well as seven other interfaces corresponding to no known formats. The device can be accessed by pulling back the skin over the right arm, like a shirt sleeve. 3. A 24-core processor array has been implanted in the brain, which translates input from all artificial components essentially allowing SCP-191 to read and write computer data without the use of an external interface. Internal communication is carried out through fiber optic cables, implanted through the glial cells and the entire nervous system. Damage to the brain stem and cerebellum due to the implantation procedure has severely damaged SCP-191's motor skills. 4. The right hand and right foreleg have been replaced with artificial components consisting primarily of steel, carbon fiber, and an unknown polymer-like substance. The exposed areas of tissue are susceptible to injury and infection. Due to damage to the spinothalamic tract, SCP-191 has reduced pain and temperature sensitivity in its limbs. Reconstructive surgery by Dr. was able to provide some relief, but regular doses of antibiotics and analgesics are still required. 5. The lungs, heart, and major blood vessels have been replaced with mechanical analogs. It has been determined that this system would allow SCP-191's bodily systems to be restarted after death. 6. The digestive system has been completely reconfigured, to the point where regular food intake is both unnecessary and dangerous. Waste is now disposed of via a drainage system located in the lower back and consists of a thick, dark gray, viscous slime. 7. The reproductive organs, uterus, ovaries, etc., have been removed and replaced with data expunged. According to R's notes, this was done to provide extra space by removing non-vital components. Hormone therapy has been proposed to counteract the long-term effects of the missing glands. This proposal is under review, pending analysis of possible complications. 8. At least 15 other alterations of unknown purpose. Given this fact, and the haphazard integration of the useful components, it is believed that they were performed merely to test the viability of such procedures on other subjects. 
Investigations are underway as to whether Dr. was planning to data expunged. At present, any theories as to the purpose behind these alterations are speculative at best. As said doctor died during the raid in which SCP-191 was recovered. See notes below, and the only surviving records of his research are a single half-burned spiral-bound notebook consisting mostly of cryptic notes regarding a higher purpose. History SCP-191 was recovered by Foundation agents during a brief collaborative effort with the Global Occult Coalition, in which a raid was conducted on the laboratory of Dr. A suspected member of SCP-191 was the only test subject recovered from the laboratory. All other test subjects expired during the raid, either disposed of by said doctor or eliminated as hostiles by the task force. Preliminary assessment concluded that full reconstruction was impossible, that the components introduced were too technologically advanced to risk becoming widely known, and that it could be a source of valuable data if kept alive. Subject was classified SCP-191 and was moved to site its disappearance, and those of the other test subjects was later blamed on a local serial killer who was arranged to be killed in prison while awaiting trial. Addendum 191-01 Testing of SCP-191's abilities has commenced. Experiment Log 191 Note this is a test log for exploring the capabilities of SCP-191. Please remember that SCP-191 is a research tool, not an entertainment center. Any test involving games or other recreational technology should be conducted in a professional manner, and not for amusement. Dr. Subject Paint A ubiquitous, simple drawing program Instructions Interface with a computer via USB port, and draw specified pictures using paint. Results SCP-191 was instantly able to emulate the functions of a mouse and keyboard. When showed any photograph, 191 was able to reproduce it within seconds using only the pencil tool, creating copies indistinguishable from the original. After the test was recorded, it was noticed that SCP-191 had continued drawing in additional paint files. SCP-191 appeared surprised and opened a text file on screen, claiming that it had not realized it was still drawing. The following drawings were discovered. Three people wearing what appeared to be GOC uniforms, standing in a burning office, pointing guns at a man across the room. The man is committing suicide via gunshot wound to the head, his face obscured by blood. An adult and child trick-or-treating. The child is a girl wearing makeup similar to that worn by Boris Karloff in Frankenstein. SCP-191 was once again asked if it was really feeling well, and once again replied, via text file, that it was fine, and that the expunged didn't mean anything. Subject: Undisclosed Video Game Instructions Attempt to emulate the functions of a Wiimote and play a video game. Result test began poorly, as SCP-191's impaired motor skills caused it to snap the disc in two before it could place it in the console. SCP-191 became distressed. It then stared at the disc, and the red light from its eye changed to green for a moment. When Dr. returned with a fresh disc, less than two minutes had passed. The game was already running on the machine. Said doctor inquired as to how that happened and a message appeared on the screen saying, I looked at the ones and the zeros, and I loaded those in. I'm sorry, I know I'm not supposed to do it this way, but I didn't want you to waste a disc. Please don't be angry. SCP-191 still seemed fearful of reprimand, even after being reassured that it was doing excellently. SCP-191 made a perfect run-through of the game, despite the fact that it did not make any physical movements consistent with the Wii controls. Subject a well-known video effects program, a 40-second video file from a security camera located in the employee cafeteria. Instructions Perform a series of video enhancement techniques used by forensic detectives on the popular television drama <laughs> Techniques that cannot actually be done in reality. Zoom and Enhance SCP-191 was instructed to zoom in on the window over the parking lot and render the license plates on the cars 
which were illegible from this distance. The actual license plates had been photographed for reference. Uncrop. SCP-191 was asked to shrink the video by 100 pixels on every side and fill in the blank space with what it believed the rest of the cafeteria looked like. Again, data that was not actually available in the video. Rotate Camera SCP-191 was informed of the exact location and angle of the other security camera in the cafeteria and asked to render the scene as viewed from that angle, filling in the parts that the camera did not see. The actual footage from the second camera was requisitioned and held for reference. Result SCP-191 could not understand the instructions at first. Dr. R*** had to provide a lengthy explanation and then stand behind SCP-191 and give it instructions one step at a time. It was several minutes before the test could even begin. However, once SCP-191 actually got started, the videos and frames were finished in less than seven minutes, of which at least three were spent watching the rendering progress bar. Zoom and Enhance Test SCP-191 successfully rendered close-ups of the license plates, complete with photorealistic scratches and dents. However, the plates were found not to match the license plates on the vehicles. SCP-191 typed, the data wasn't there, so I had to guess. Uncrop Test SCP-191 expanded the video canvas and filled in what was in the blank space, rendering the extra image seamlessly. It did not match the actual cafeteria, but once again, the data was not in the video file, and SCP-191 had been forced to guess. Rotate Camera Test The generated video matched the angle of the second camera perfectly, and almost everything visible from the angle of camera 1 matched the scene in camera 2 very closely. As before, places not visible were very different. One table only visible in camera 2 that had been seating was now, in the generated video, seating the attending doctor and agent supervising SCP-191, eating lunch and talking. Although there were many visual differences between the original videos and SCP-191's copies, many on-site personnel were unable to determine which ones were the forgeries. End Log Psychological Analysis by Dr. Glass SCP-191 has responded fairly well to containment. It is completely docile and cooperative and when not being interacted with, it spends most of its time sitting still or curled up in a fetal position. This may be a sign of distress, but it is more likely for physical comfort, as normal body movements and postures are difficult. Mental acuity is questionable. Although capable of rapid data analysis and communications when physically linked to a computer system, it seems unable to follow conversations with human beings, unless the conversant speaks slowly and uses simple words. Complex tasks are also impossible, unless it is guided at every step. Its mood seems consistent, though somewhat inscrutable. It continually affects melancholy, will not make eye contact unless asked to, and any attempts to induce a cheerful or humorous mood have proven fruitless. However, it shows no signs of ongoing mental distress, and claims, through computer interface, that it is feeling well. To date, SCP-191 has not requested access to, or information about, any acquaintance it had before its abduction. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now, and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.